quest for the Jesus of History, Presentation 3, The Third Quest. My friends, we could spend months going over the details about the three quests for the historical Jesus. Obviously, what we're getting here in this workshop is a very condensed version of everything. Today, we explore the third quest and its origins with Robert Funk, his West Star Institute, and its Jesus Seminar. The third quest began in 1986 and its effects continue to the present day. The disastrous results of the new quest led New Testament scholar Robert Funk to launch what is now called the third quest. In the spring of 1986, Funk sent letters to about 150 New Testament scholars inviting them all to a meeting at the University of Redlands in California. That meeting, now viewed as an historic moment in the history of New Testament scholarship, was the beginning of the most exhaustive quest for the historical Jesus ever attempted. The first quest, an exclusively liberal Protestant affair. With 1953 to 1984, we have the second quest, which was a collaboration between Protestants and Catholics. The third quest now involves Protestants, Catholics, Jews, and atheists. The third quest is the first one to use all materials reporting the teachings and deeds of Jesus not just those found in the four canonical Gospels. One of the agreements that was made when all these scholars gathered at the Redlands was that they would no longer limit themselves to the four canonical Gospels. Every tiny scrap that might have something attributed to Jesus buried in it, known from anywhere in antiquity, would be used. This meant collecting every known gospel, every known early Jesus group writer, every sermon of early preachers still existent in existence, every known piece of evidence related to traditions of Jesus' sayings. These scholars agreed that for their purposes, the canon had to be broken. When we talk about the Jesus Seminar and the Third Quest breaking the canon, understand that this is not a religious statement or a theological statement, but simply a scholarly statement. A lot of people criticize the Jesus Seminar. They say they were coming out with endless theological controversies and producing heretical theologies. My friends, I got to tell you, that's impossible. The Jesus Seminar produced no theologies. How can you have theologies being produced by atheists? Since theology is an outcome of faith, you have a body that were consisted of pretty strong believers all the way to non-believers that could never have produced a coherent theological statement. So this was not about producing theologies this was producing New Testament scholarship. What these scholars meant by the canon must be broken was not a theological statement. What it was was that they could not limit their quest for the historical Jesus to the canon alone. Rather, their responsibility was to learn everything that can be known from any source anywhere in existence. The canon or official list of sacred and inspired books is the church's listing. It is religious in orientation, it is theological. You all understand that? Right. All right. But these scholars said that while addressing the question of the historical Jesus, they could not operate within the canonical gospel parameters. When the Jesus Seminaris completed the collecting process, they discovered that in the world, there exists 503 known attributed Jesus sayings. No more and no less. 
Many of these are quoted by early messianist writers and early Christian writers. The ones that are not in our canonical New Testament. Are they historical? Did the historical Jesus say them? And how would you know? The Jesus Seminarist collected an enormous pile of data. The next step, what criteria would these scholars use for deciding what is historical against what is theological? This turned out to be an exceedingly sophisticated undertaking. The Jesus Seminar met twice per year. Almost immediately, they were embroiled in fierce and widely publicized controversy, a controversy that exists to this day. The endeavors of these scholars and their meetings hit the headlines of many newspapers in red. Big, bold font. In one meeting, the Press News Corps of Atlanta, Georgia, besieged the conference hall and hotels where these scholars were gathered and deliberating. Much to the horror of many of these New Testament scholars, it was a media circus, and Robert Funk loved every single minute of it. Consider, if you would, the problem of criteria for determining the historicity of a Jesus saying. Think about it. You're looking at a Jesus saying. And you're trying to ask, is this a theological edition later on? Or is this the actual historical saying of the historical Jesus? How do you filter out your own prior theological commitments? And how do you filter out your own culture and its baggage? And how do you filter out your own gender and its baggage. And how do you filter out the things that matter most to you individually in your life? My friends, you can't do that. And I want you to keep that in mind because a PhD and even a being hailed as an incredible scholar and actually being an incredible New Testament scholar like these Jesus seminarists were, they couldn't do it either. I want you to keep that in mind. Again, according to the church's official teaching of our Catholic tradition here, the Gospels are a primary source for looking at Jesus. And they can only, the Gospels, be looked at and understood rightly as something that developed, as something that evolved. The Gospels themselves emerged through a three-stage process. Stage one, the original words and sayings of Je and deeds of Jesus. Stage two, the oral proclamation of Jesus after he died and was proclaimed risen as Messiah and Cosmic Lord, soon to return to inaugurate theocracy. And stage three, after the deaths of the first apostles, communities set up by them also have crises which occasion the writings of the narrative gospels we have in our in our canon and other writings too that we don't have in our canon so here again stage one stage two and stage three but how do we determine what criteria must we use to determine what is stage one, what is stage two, and what is stage three? We mentioned last time that Luke, the document we call Luke, the gospel we call Luke, has a literary history like any writing. But its, it's literary history is not that of a Western 21st century biography. It can't even be called an ancient biography. It's something different. From the vantage of the Gospels as literary compositions, we can say that they have three levels. And when we read them with more or less precision, we can peel back the levels.
Both the Jesus Seminar scholars and other 20th century New Testament scholars came up with different scholarly criteria for determining what in a Jesus saying is a later theological modification and what in a Jesus saying is historical. That is to say, what in a Jesus saying is stage two or three and what in a Jesus saying is stage one. Most of the criteria, no matter how sophisticated they are, are not very good filters for the baggage of the scholar's prior theological commitments. Cultural baggage, gender baggage, and personal values and experiences, which shape how he or she perceives, interprets, and communicates reality. So the problem was colossally dif difficult. The third quest began in the fall of 1986 at that first meeting in the University of Redlands. But for the context group of scholars, a group of scholars that had been invited with these 150 others, Bruce Molina, John Pilch, Jerome Nery, Richard Rohrbaugh, and others, it continued into a, until a horrendous explosion. Let me take a little excursus for the context group. At the time, about a dozen biblical scholars working on the anthropological, cultural, and social world of Jesus and the biblical world kept warning Funk, you are making horrendous historical mistakes because you do not understand the culture. Funk dismissed the context group's concerns and their crucial insights enlightened by the social sciences, anthropological studies, and cultural studies. Funk refused to slow down. To see why slowing down mattered, take for example the newness and the difference of Jesus. Don't you have to assume that unless the historical Jesus said something new and different, he would not have had any impact at all? I mean, we can all agree, right, that the historical Jesus had impact. He moved people. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been crucified, right? And he wouldn't also have left a, a, a significant impact in history if he hadn't done something new and different, right? Well, the Jesus seminarists got that. They got that, yeah, something had to be different about Jesus from his surrounding people. Otherwise, we wouldn't know about him. Question, how do you know what is new and different in a culture from which there is so little information available? Over and over and over and over again, the context group would sit in the conference halls of Jesus seminar meetings where other scholars would argue a particular saying of Jesus was historical because it would have been shocking or surprising to listeners. And the context group would object to the surrounding sem their fellow seminarists. Is what is shocking to 20th century Americans shocking to 1st century Palestinians? Zero Palestinians? And how would you know that? So, the criteria that were being used and collected and developed by the seminars proved to be enormously difficult. The Jesus Seminar spent its first couple of years doing nothing but sorting out their way through the criteria. Once the criteria were determined and set, they began by using them to work through all 503 known attributed Jesus sayings, one by one. On every single one of these 503 sayings, enormous time and energy was spent. Here is a part of the keynote address by Robert Funk, who addressed his fellow scholars launching the Jesus Seminar, and along with it, the third quest, in that first meeting at the University of Redlands, fall 1986. We are about to embark on a momentous enterprise. We're going to inquire simply, rigorously, after the voice of Jesus, after what he really said. 
In this process, we will be asking a question that borders on the sacred, that even abuts blasphemy for many in our society. As a consequence, the course we shall follow may prove hazardous. We may provoke hostility, but we will set out in spite of the dangers. Do you get the feeling that this guy's a little full of, uh, I mean, come on. In spite of the dangers, because we are professionals and because the issue of Jesus is there to be faced, much as Mount Everest confronts the team of climbers and on and on and on. He wants to be James Kirk, doesn't he, Robert Funk? Real bad. But he turns out to be a little bit like P.T. Barnum. The idea behind the Jesus Seminar, an idea that attracted so many honest New Testament scholars, including those of the context group, was a good scholarly ambition and a research project that was noble. But Funk was full of baloney, and he played the media with the skill of a P.T. Barnum. But how did Funk view himself and his Jesus Seminar? Probably something like this. Jesus Seminar as the Starship Enterprise of New Testament scholarship. But what was produced often had these efforts to appear somewhat differently. <laughs> hey, thanks for watching. Just continue the playlist for the next part of the study. If you have further questions, this is good. They will get addressed, so keep watching. If you found value, please subscribe, like, and share. As always, questions, comments, and criticisms are most welcome. God bless you.